and this is my first slide set. It's an introduction. I actually made it for a different course, so it has a little bit at the beginning that is not so important for us. It has a little bit of an introduction. R is actually an open source version of the programming language S, which is around for ever, for a long time. Uh, it is the de facto uh, language in which statisticians express their models. Um, and R has now, I think, 500 or 1,000 add-on packages with code that people wrote that do different things. And most of them are geared towards the cutting edge of technology. So those are statistical techniques or data mining techniques that are really right now being developed and you might not find those in a commercial tool that typically lags five or six years behind. In R you find also all the base tools, but you also find those in, 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 in SAS and SPSS uh, as well. So what does R do for us? It helps us with data handling and storage. I don't know if anybody ever worked with like a scripting language and some, some data that was used. It's a real pain. I started out with Perl and it was like really, really, really bad because you have like 50 Perl scripts and you like read data from the disk, store it in a different file, then you read it with a different script, store it in a different file, and after a month I had no idea what was in what file and what did I run again and did I change some code but then didn't run the script and didn't know if that data is up to date and it was really bad. Uh, and the worst thing for, for researchers at least is, is that you do some experiments, then you have your data, right? So if you're doing your PhD or master's thesis, you will have that problem maybe. You do your data, then you write your paper, then you submit your paper, and three months later they tell you, yes, but we need a little change. And then three months later you go look at your code and you say, oh my God, three months ago I knew exactly what was going on, now I have no idea, right? And then you need to change something a little, and then, then there's file missing, some data is missing, and it's, it's gonna be really, really bad. R helps you doing that in a little bit of a, of a cleaner way where you don't have to like write so much to files and you can store it in your workspace and, and it's usually a little easier, at least for me it was a big, big improvement from what I was doing before. Then it has all types of calculations that you would expect from a programming language uh, and it is array or matrix based, kind of like Whoever had MATLAB before, you know that you can multiply a matrix with a vector and so forth. So all the things that are in R are also vectorized. So they happen to a whole vector in once and you don't have to write loops so much. Um, then you have a really extensive tool of, or, or a set of tools for data analysis that come from the statistical area with all the visualizations and bar plots and so forth. And you have a really large tool set of data mining algorithms in there. Um, and it comes with a simple programming language that's called R. And it looks somewhat similar to MATLAB. It's not too hard to learn. If you learned another programming language, it's going to be relatively easy to, to do that with, with R. You can do if statements and loops, and we will look at all of those. And the extension mechanism in R is pretty nice because it has an online mirror of all the packages, so all you do in R is you see, I want this package, and then you just click the button and it, it installs it, right? So I guess people are now more and more used to that kind of, kind of thing that you don't have to find it somewhere, download it, and install it, but it happens all in the system. So R is completely open source and free to use. Um, there's a really huge user and developer community so if you look on, on websites like, what is it called? Slash dot thing, whatever, where everybody asks questions about, about programming, you will find almost all questions there with, with answers. There's lots of extension packages. Uh, it creates really good visualizations. Uh, the New York Times the economists use regularly R to produce the, the visualizations that they have in their publications online and in print. There's a, uh, a commercial solution which is called Revolution that you can go to if you need for your company uh, uh, um, commercial support. Uh, R can be easily parallelized. There's lots of tools in there where you can do loops in parallel and so forth. Um, also on, 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 on clusters with more machines. Uh, and with Revolution Analytics it also is better for big data. Uh, I think we looked at the website so we don't need to like 
look at those anymore. This was whenever I did this, I guess 2011. Uh, it is pretty much unchanged from what we saw before. It was rapid minor first, R second, Excel, and third. I think SQL, they added SQL later on. That's why it's not in this list. But it really did not change over the last few years very much. OK, installing R. I think I showed you last time where to go, right? So you go to this website and then download the version for your operating system and install it, and it should be pretty painless. And now your first session. So I use um, R Studio, and R Studio kind of like looks like this. I had already some code in here. That's why there is, uh, is certain things here. Um, basically, that's where you type your code. So you can type a command, and then it will answer it, right? Then here you have variables that you have in memory right now. If you make graphs, they, they are here. And here you can open files. And what you typically do if you say, oh, I did this command, and this was really awesome, then you just copy it and put it up here. And you save this file, so you have then a list of all the, the commands that, that worked really well. And later on, you can run this as a script, and you can just go there and say, run this, and it will just execute it. Again, I only think clicked on S, that's why it's complaining. Uh, and that's a very good way to do it. Uh, lots of people start initially with typing everything down here, uh, and it's okay because you have a history and it tells you what you did. Uh, but after a while, it gets really confusing because I cannot type a really long command straight and it works the first time, so I have to like do trial and error. Uh, and then I don't know which version was the good one, so I really take then the one that was really good and copy it over, over to here. I think you can say to source and it will just like copy that line over here. So it's kind of like my notepad that tells me what are the things that really worked. And then later on, if you have to redo everything that you did, you just run this script and it should hopefully run without a problem. OK, let's now go back to the, to the first session. OK, so you have a prompt here, and you can type stuff. And the first thing that I want to do is I want to create a vector called x, and I want to give it the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And that's the way we do it. That's the assignment operator. Don't use the equal sign. The assignment is an arrow. It can go to the left or to the right. If you want to assign something to the right, that's fine too. I have not seen many lines of code where that was necessary. So usually it's just an arrow to the left. You create a name and then you assign values. And this is 1 through 10. So the colon here is an operator that makes uh, a vector from this value to that value. It could also be in descending order if you say 10 colon 1, then it will do 10, 9, and so forth. OK, and then you can just take the name and push Enter, and it will tell you what the values are in here. So it will say the values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, this thing here is really just like a line number. If you have lots of values, at some point it will do a line break, and it will just say, oh, this is line number 2, line number 3. But it has nothing to do with x. It's just about the presentation. Um, then you can do arithmetic, you can add the value 1 to x, and what it does is it realizes x is a vector, so I just add 1 to each element of the vector, and that's why you get 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it's bound to the variable name y. Then if you want to know what's in your so-called workspace, r keeps a workspace, then you can do ls for list. You have to put uh, um, parentheses here because it's a function. R is a purely functional programming language, so basically everything that you do that's not an operator needs to have uh, those parentheses here. And it tells me in there is text. I think I created this variable somewhere, and the variable x and the variable y. And then if you want to leave R, you need to call the function quit. Q, it's a function. That's why it has parentheses. Otherwise, it won't work. And then it leaves R, and I think it will ask you, do you want to save your workspace? And you can say yes or no. If you say yes, then it will save those variables with the values. And next time you start R from the same folder or directory, then it will read that back, and, and you can, can keep on working. Yes? Where did text come from? The, the text? Oh, the text. So I, I automatically generated those, those uh, uh, slides. 
and I think the generator that makes the slides uses that variable for something I, I did not create it, right? So, so please ignore, ignore this one. Okay, so it's good that it, that it saves the workspace. I never save my workspace because it has one big problem with data mining, which is that we usually have lots of data we loaded in our workspace, and then every time you quit R, it has to save all the data as a workspace. And every time you start R, it has to load all the data, and after a while, you will see that when you start R, it takes like five seconds, and I don't like that. So I actually every time say no, and I use what I showed you before. Let's see, where do I have my thing? What I use is I put all my lines of code up here. So next time I load R and I want to do the same thing, I actually just execute the code up here. Uh, it also helps me with, with, with the fact that I'm not quite sure that I will in the future need X and Y, and it doesn't make for me sense to have it in, in my workspace every time I start R. If you're a neat person, you can use the workspace and clean it out every day. Uh, I'm not so neat, so I, I don't, don't use that. Okay. The next thing, a few helpful things. There is a question mark, which is an operator, which actually is just a short form of this function here, and you can do question mark and for example, a command like the function ls that we had before to list, and it will give you help about this, and we can look how that looks like. If I say question mark, I wonder if I can make this bigger. Guess it's bigger. I can say question mark ls. And then it will open up down here a help page. It will tell me this is the command ls, the function ls. It's in the base package of R. Uh, the title is lists objects, and then it says ls and objects return stuff. It tells you what kind of arguments it can take. I used it without any, so it uses the default arguments. It has for each of the arguments a description, then it has a detailed description what it does. Uh, and the most important part about uh, those help pages is it has an example section. And this code is supposed to be made in a way that you can just take it and copy it over here. And it will execute those examples and it should show you all the functionalities uh, that it has. Uh, for lots of the things that we will do, data mining algorithms, those examples are really good because they typically load a really small example data set and then they really use this method on the small example data set. And you can basically copy this code instead of the example data set, load your own data set, and can have basically a starting point of how to, how to use this thing. Okay. If you use R not from R Studio, then the help, help is a little harder to read, I guess, on the, at least on the Unix version. The Windows version, I think, opens the web browser or opens the browser. Uh, if you want to open a web browser with help, sorry, that's what, not what I wanted to do. Then you can do this. You can say help.start. And then, okay, this is intercepted here. Let's do this in just vanilla R. Then it opens hopefully somewhere a web browser and you can go through, those are all the packages that I have installed and then you can go into a package and it tells you what functions are in the package and you can kind of like go between those and it has also hyperlinks, I guess. Let's take this one, abbreviate. This one doesn't have a hyperlink, plot, let's see. Doesn't have one either. Some of them, let's look at this one. This one doesn't either have hyperlinks to other, other commands. Sometimes it says uh, this command does this and this, but there's five other commands that do similar things and you have a hyperlink here to click and, and you're able to read um, what they do. Okay, so far so good. How to get ho help. Sometimes, or initially actually really often, you just have no idea how this command or function is supposed to be called, right? Uh, so you are not even able to see question mark in the name of the function because you just don't know the name of the function. And for this case, you can do keyword search. You can do question mark, question mark. And for example, I want to solve something, I guess some, 
I don't know, linear equations or something, and I have no idea how, how to do it. So you could, let's go back here, do this question mark, solve, and then it basically looks through everything that you have installed and tells you in the package APE there is something that has something to do with solve, but you see it says resolve, so that's probably not what we want to do. There's clue solve, it says solve linear some assignment problems. And you can go through those and can kind of like find where is a function in what package that might have something to do with solving. For example, this says it's a DSP solver, a driving salesperson solver. Um, alternatively, you can also just Google it and say I want R and something and often you get a web page that is either the manual page that describes it or some other person's blog or whatever that says how, how it works. Um, there's more help that you can have on this website here. Let's see if I can open this on granrproject.org. That's where you can download R and there's something that's really interesting which is called task views. And task views has here a list of different topics, different areas, and then it has manually curated by a specialist a description of what packages are useful for this area and, and um, what they do. For example, if we look at machine learning, which is very much related to data mining, then it says here, Torsten Horton uh, did this. The latest update was in August on the 8th. And then he says, okay, there's neural networks and there's those two packages that do that. And then there's recursive partitioning and there's all those packages that do that. And then for random forest, those are the packages that do that. And they describe a little bit what those packages can do. And, and it's really very useful to go through those and say, oh, I really need to do support vector machines. So that's where I need to start, right, with those packages. Since the names of the packages are often not useful, right? For example, why would a package be called E1071 that does support vector machines? You would probably never figure out that that package is related to it, but using those task views, you can actually, uh, actually find things pretty nicely. And also the task views have typically the most important packages about different areas in there because somebody manually maintains that. You can also look at this search here and can search, I don't know, let's try solve again. And then it will basically look through web pages that are related to the R project and, and give you different files that, that you can start looking at for quadratic programming or whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, task views and we looked at searching, so that's pretty good. The next thing, a little bit about the R programming language. R is case sensitive. Even if your operating system pretends not to be case sensitive, a lowercase letter and an uppercase letter are different, right? Uppercase X and lowercase X, they are not the same variable. They're, they are different, kind of like in C and C++. Um, always use the assignment operator. Don't use the equal sign. It seems like it might work sometimes, but don't use it. It has a special meaning, uh, and this is really the assignment operator that you should use. You can separate commands with a semicolon. You don't need to if you separate them by line, if you go to the next line. Uh, you can use regular brackets to, to uh, I think it ate them here. It really needs braces, so the curly brackets to make, make group expressions, kind of like blocks in programming languages. So you use usually the curly brackets, right? Um, and then the hash mark is for comments. Um, let's now go again to our R session. So if I say list the objects that are in my workspace, then we get again this weird text, but X and Y, that's the two ones that we had. You can um, look at the data if you, if you exit R, then it stores it in something that's called dot R data, that's your workspace. So you can remove this file if for example R takes five minutes to open because you have so much in there, then you can look at this file, it's probably really big and you can just remove it, but you will lose your workspace, right? You will lose everything that's in there. Uh, you can also in R remove individual objects from the workspace. For example, if I remove with RMX, then my workspace has only Y and this weird text variable in there. Okay, now some 
some basics. You can use a value. If you type in a value like one, then it will just return the same value and say, yes, you gave me a value that was one, right? If you do an assignment and use a vector, if you reuse a name that you had already, then the information that was stored with this name before is lost and this new information is, is attached to the name. Uh, and one of the most important functions is C for combine. It combines values, it builds vectors. For example, this here reads, I want to combine 10.4, 5.6, 3.1, 6.4, and 21.7 into a vector. Those are the arguments for the function C and assign it to X. And then once I look at X, it has just this vector with, with those values. Then you can do division one over X and each element is divided one over the value and you get, get those values. You can do more combinations. You can, for example, take the value of X, combine it with, which is a vector, right? Combine it with zero and the vector and then you get one copy of the value vector, the zero and the next copy of the vector. So it's very useful to building vectors. Um, you can do things with two vectors. For example, I have vector X and vector Y. They are not the same length because vector Y we just created with the value of all the values that are in X plus a zero and the values again um, and add them. But now it's a little bit strange because we cannot add two vectors if they are not the same length. The, Standard addition for vectors here is that each element is added to the corresponding element in the other vector. So first element to the first element, second element to the second element. And that of course doesn't work. It works for the first few. And if we check 10.4 plus 10.4 is really 20.8. So that's great. 5.6 plus 5.6 is 11.2. That's great. But what do we do here after zero? It, it seems like it should actually add zero to nothing to zero. And the result should be zero, but the result is actually 10.4. Right, and here it should add 10.4 to zero, and it's actually 16.0. How could I offset only one item in the vector? Uh, I think I, on one slide you will see how to subset the vector. It's kind of, it's, it looks like in Java, right? You do brackets and, and just see which one you want. Okay, so, but still the question is why do we have 10.4 here? And the answer is that R recycles the shorter vector. And recycling means if there's no more value here, it starts over at the beginning. So it takes 10.4 and adds 10.4 to zero. That's why we have 10.4. For 10.4 down here, it's already one position further. It takes 5.6. That's why we get 16 and so forth. So recycling is very interesting. In this case, it's not very intuitive. So you need to actually be careful about it. If you have two vectors that are not the same length, and recycling is not what you had in mind. You will still get it and it will not give you a warning or anything. It will just happen. And sometimes when you get weird results, that might be one of the problems that you had one thing where you thought, oh, those are both vectors of length 10, but in reality you had one vector of length 10 and one vector of length two and, and get kind of like weird things. Uh, then there's lots of helpful functions. Getting the sum of a vector, you just say sum. Getting the length of a vector, you say length. And there's lots of other functions. You can get the product of all of them by just saying product. Uh, and you can easily find those and, and it makes, makes life so much easier than in C++ where you would have to write a loop to sum, right? Um, the next thing is, so those values that we have here, they are all doubles. In R it's actually called numeric or real values. Uh, and that's the basic um, data type that R handles because it comes from the statistics community and, and statisticians are not big into integers and counting. Everything they have are measurements. So everything that we have typically are um, numeric values. You can have integer values and one place where we get this is if we do a sequence. So from one to five, we get actually five integer values. And the way that we figure out that something is an integer or a numeric is there's a function called class, which gives you the class of the values in a certain variable. For example, S1 gets 1 through 5, so it's 1 through 5. If we ask for the class of S1, it says it actually is integer. Let's try to get the class of 1, 2, 3. So that's 1, 2, 3. It looks like they're integer, right? But actually it says here down here that it's not integer, it's numeric. And that's just another name that it's actually a real 
variables. So it's actually 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. And like in C++, it just doesn't show the 0.0. In Java, it would say 0.0, right? OK, so far so good. So those are integers. Um, we can also make sequences in different ways. For example, if I want a sequence that goes from minus 1 to 1 and in increments of 0.2, then you can use a function called sequence. And you get a sequence that is exactly that, minus 1, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.6, and so forth, all the way to 0 and then all the way to up. Sequence has other ways you can do it as well. You could go from minus 1 to 1 in 100 steps, so in 50 steps, then you would get that sequence. With question mark sequence, you will get the information of how, how to do this. You can also repeat things. For example, if I have S1, which is from 1 through 5, and I want to repeat it two times, then I get a vector that has the sequence repeated twice, right? If instead of times I say each, then it repeats each element two times. So the first element two times, the second element two times, the third, and so forth. Um, to do that. And again, with question mark, sequence, and repetition, you can figure out how this works. They seem all really small and not really useful by themselves, but if you use those, you will see that you can easily populate matrices and vectors with different combinations of, of, of numbers uh, and then multiply them with each other, and you will get pretty good and interesting and useful results. Okay, there is also a data type that's logical, which is a Boolean data type. Uh, and you get this when you use a comparison operator. For example, if x has those five values, and you ask if x is greater than 13, and you assign it to a variable l, then l has uh, logical values. It says the first value was not greater than 13, the second one was not greater, the third and the fourth were not greater, but the last one was greater than 13, and we can check that's really, really the case. And if you look at the class of l, it will tell you, okay, it's logical. Um, for people who did C++, um, then you know that C++ automatically translates between Boolean and integer, right? Does it? Java not anymore. In Java, they stopped that with version, I don't know, 2.0 uh, because it made too, much, too many problems. Um, you can do similar things here. Here, it's called coercion. In, in other programming languages, you would say casting, the data type. Um, so you could coerce this logical vector into a numeric vector by using s dot and then the data type that you want to have. And we see that false corresponds to 0 and true corresponds to 1. Um, and this is not integer, it's really its numbers. Sometimes this is very useful. Let's say you have a vector that's logical, that's length 500, and you want to know how many trues are in there, right? What you could do is you could just sum it up. Because summing would make it into numeric. It would make each false into a 0, each true into a 1. You just add up how many truths are in there by adding up the ones, right? So you can do things very efficiently and quickly by using those, those coercions. Uh, and you can expect all the regular operators, less than, less equals than. Uh, equals is also two equal signs, like in other programming languages. Not equals, and logical, and, and logical, or. OK. Oh, if you want to know about those, since those operators are not regular letters you have when you say question mark, have to put it under double quotation marks, or R will be unhappy and not do what, what you want it to do. OK. Missing values and infinity. Who did use, did you use missing values or infinity already in one of your programs before in your programming assignments? No? So for data mining, missing values are really important. Infinity, not so much, but missing values can happen a lot in data mining, right? Where you just don't know the exact, exact height of a person. Um, and the good thing is, in the IEEE standard for uh, 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 floating point numbers, the values missing, positive infinity, negative infinity, they all exist. They're all defined. So actually, all your Java and C++ programs can deal with missing values and, and infinity values. Um, we just don't know how, right? And that's why we don't use them. And who wants to use infinity anyway? OK, we need to at least look at, at NA. So in R, you say just NA with two capital letters. And that is a missing value. For example, I could make a vector that consists of 1 through 3 and then an NA and assign that to C. I use C for combining. 
do the variable C and then I have one, two, three, and, and an A at the end. It shows it in the same way as a missing value. And if I want to know if there's a missing value in this vector, then I can use a special function which is called is.na. It gives me a logical value back and it says the first one was not an A, the second one, the third one were not an A, but the last one was an A. And I could use this, for example, for filtering and I could filter out all the ones that are NAs by later on subsetting this vector C and I will show you how to, how to do this. Division by zero, what happens in Java when you divide by zero? An exception? If it's two integers, then it's a an n. If they are, if it's a real, then you get an exception. Is that right? Mm -hmm. With integers, but those are two real numbers because if I don't say that they're supposed to be integer, that the default data type here is is that. Uh, what do you get in C plus <laughs> plus? You can test it really, really quickly. Um, in R, you get by definition if you divide zero by zero an a n n an n a n, which is not a number because it's defined to be not a number. You don't get an exception. Your program does not stop or anything. You get this special value, and you can later on do more computations with this value. I think if you take a not a number, let's see what happens. Let's see if that's still the case after some error. So I said, what happens if I take not a number and add one? Then it's still not a number, right? And I can probably multiply it with something, and it will still not be a number. So it has rules of how to deal with not a number. The rule basically is that no matter what I do with it, it, it will never become a number. OK, so far so good. So it's great that R does not like die or stop. But on the other hand, if you do like a week of computation and then the result is not a number because somewhere at the beginning you had a problem that's kind of like not so fun, right? Yes? What if we added a vector that has four? Uh, and is? Okay, can you push the button here so that the people that are okay. this can So my question it? is, what if we added a vector that has four values mm -hmm. to the z vector that we defined that has a missing value in it? Let's let's do that. Okay, so the z vector. I hope I can. Oh, I, I am not allowed to just copy that here. That's mean. Okay, so, so let's make a new z vector. So z gets one through three, and then it gets an na, right? So we had this. And then the second vector is supposed to have four real values, right? Yeah. So let's make a y vector, and that gets uh, one. one through four, right? So you have this. And then we do c plus y, right? Do we have any people here who can predict what happens or want to predict what will happen? Okay, so the, the, the first value will be easy, right? Because one and one, this, those are both numbers, will be two, right? Then two plus two will be four, three plus three will be uh, six, right? But what is four plus n? A. Three, four, or five, but actually it's still an n a, right? Yeah. Because if you have one part of this addition missing, then you don't know what the sum will be, right? And that's why you still get an n a. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's first talk about infinity and then we try it with infinity as well. Okay, so division gives you not a number which is different than an NA. NA means missing and this means it's not missing, we have it, but it's not a number, right? And the next thing is infinity. For example, if we take two to the power of 5,000, then we are far beyond what we can actually represent with our 64-bit uh, or in our, our, our does anybody know what the number space for for our doubles is? It's all the way to one times ten to the power of thirty-two. Thirty-two. I I think so too. Yes. Uh, but two to the power of five thousand is more than that, so we get infinity. So let's do that. Two to the power of so you said 10 to the power of 31 should be fine, right? Yes, 32, 33, oh, that's, that's cool, 10 to the power of 100. It's still fine, oh, now it starts to be infinity, so it's too much, right? So it's, it's some, somewhere by 10 with, with 1,000 zeros, right? 
But we know it's a floating point number, so you don't get the precision all the way to the end. You, but, but that's what it can do. And then you get infinity. And whatever you do to infinity, it stays infinity. If you divide infinity by 2, if you add something, right, it just, just stays infinity. OK. So far, so good. Next thing is characters. We need characters uh, for our programs, sometimes because it's text that we are mining, but often we just need it as the description of something. Um, and strings or character vectors in um, R look like regular ones. All you do is you do double quotation marks. You can make a vector with hello and hola, and then it will just be a vector of two elements with those two things. You can use a function called paste, which kind of like puts pieces of strings together. Um, so you can take your string and put world at the end. But now the interesting thing is it doesn't say hello all our world. It actually says hello world and all our world. And the reason is because we have a string with, or a vector with two elements and a vector with one element and world is recycled, right? It's recycled, it's once added to this one and once added to the, to the second one. Uh, magic, no. It comes from, and I will show you if you say question mark paste. It comes from the default value for the separator. The default value for the separator is one space, and that's what you get. If you don't want a space, you have to say separator equals two quotation marks without anything if you want a, a period or whatever you want in here. Okay. So far, so good. And you can now do things like that if you need uh, variable names, and you know you need variable names that are x1, y2, x3, and so forth, then you can actually use pasting and uh, uh, and reusing parts of vectors here. For example, I make a vector that's x and y and another vector that's 1 through 10, and it will just recycle x and y over and over again. So the 1 gets x, 2 gets y, 3 gets again x, and that's why you get all those, those things, right? So it's, it's very easy to construct things, things like this. And here I have the separator empty. That's why there's no space in between the variable name or, or the, the, the letter and, and the digit. OK, so far so good. You don't need to worry too much about strings because typically we deal with numbers and strings are not, not as important, um, but just so that you know. And now, how much time do we have? Just some time. Now let's think about modifying and selecting different things. Somebody already asked me how can I get an element out of a vector, and the answer is you use the subset operator, which is just brackets, so similar to C++ and, and Java. Yes, that's a problem. It says here index starts with one, which is very, very different. When you say zero, you probably get an NA uh, or something. I thought a zero index is integer zero. Oh, that, let, let's try this after we are through this page, right? Let's keep the problems for, for later. OK, so the index starts with one. This is element one, two, three, four, five, which is kind of bad for us because we are used that everything starts with zero, but statisticians don't believe in zero. They believe that there's the first one, and that's the first one, right? OK, so x1 gives us 10.4. We can remove elements with a negative sign here. So x minus 1, we, each, we want to remove the first element, and then we get just the rest, right? Um, we can select something in here, and we can use already our, our uh, uh, sequence operator here. So the sequence would make 2, 3, and 4. So the x elements at 2, 3, and 4 are 5.6, 3.1 and 6.4. Uh, you can also use combine in here. For example, if you want to select the first element and the fifth element, then you would just say C1, 5, and you would select those two, right? So all you need here is actually just a vector of, of numbers that signify what positions you want. You can also use a comparison here. You can say, I want to select from x all values where x is greater than 7. The reason why it works is not because they implemented it in a special way, but the reason is that it first evaluates x is greater than 7. You get a logical vector. And this subset operator understands what to do with a logical vector. Every place where there's a true, those are the places that I want to select. So you can also put a logical vector directly in there if that's what, what you want. Uh, and then you can also select things and replace them right away. For example, I can select in x everything that's more than 7 and replace those positions with an A. And then my vector x changes, 
and we see that everything that was too large is now in NA. And that's very useful. For example, often you find data, for example, where, where you have recorded the age of people when they buy in a supermarket alcohol, right? Then sometimes they have to type in, yes, it's 21, this person is, I don't know, 25, right? But sometimes in those data sets you find that lots of people are 99 years old. Because it's just easier for the person there to just like type 99, I'm done, right? Because that's for sure drinking age, so that's good. Uh, but of course, if you want to analyze the data, it's going to be bad because you will have ideas that like the seniors are really drinking a lot, right? Uh, it's good for them because once you're 99, I guess then you can do whatever you want anyway. Um, but that's probably not great for what you want to do with your analysis. And in that case, you could say if my age variable has exactly the value 99, then I replace it with unknown because this person just had 99, but it doesn't mean that this person is 99. I just don't know how old the person is. I hopefully know that it, the person is more than 21, right? Or at least 21. Okay, so that's, that's quite helpful to, to, to work with your data. And you said now what happens if I do index, index zero. Let's go back here. So let's say x, is that still in there? No. Oh, why? Okay, so index one gives me the value of one, right? But what if I get index zero? And then it says integer zero. And that integer zero means that's actually a function. Look what I get if I say integer zero. Oops, yeah, I have it not typed in. Integer zero. I get back integer zero too. What it means is this is an integer vector of length zero. So if I select something that doesn't exist, then I get an empty vector back with no elements. You can actually also say integer 10. Then you get an integer vector of length 10, and the default value is you get all zeros there. That's the same thing, but those zeros and those zeros are not the same thing. Those are integer zeros, and those are doubles. Right? You can look at class, and it will say numeric here. And if I say integer, it will say integer. Uh, often people that, that use R just casually and do their analysis, they don't really care if it's integer or numeric because it automatically is converted internally anyway if it has to. Um, only if you do programming with R, then sometimes it's important to know, oh, this is an integer and this is a numeric value. Uh, same thing, since we already do this, what happens if I use an index that's too large in Java. I get an exception. What happens if I do it in C++? No, you just like either oh. e either get a quarter amp or not, depending on, on how, how far away. Yes. So you can access it, you get out of memory, whatever is at that position. If it's yours, it's great. If it's somebody else's, then your program will be stopped and you will get a, 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 a segment default, right? Okay. Uh, in R, you get again, oh, you get an NA. That's so, I thought you would get also a, a vector of length zero, but you don't. What happens if I say, oh, negative, we know. If I say negative one, then I just get removed the first element. Okay. Since we are there, let's do this. Let's, oh, way, yes. Say oh, let's see, well, I don't know what happens. Let's yeah. minus 10. Then it says, I removed element 10, you still have your first four elements. <laughs> okay, but what I wanted to do is, what if I put at length 10, the value 10? And it's only length 4, right? So that should not do anything. But interestingly, what happens is, it extends it, says, I don't know what the others are, but at 10, you wanted a 10, right? Okay, so, and that's why you would get for y 1,000 and an a, because technically, there is something there that we don't know what it is, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we don't know what's at position 1,000 because nobody assigns anything there yet. Hmm? I think it internally does not access it. It internally looks at, oh, what I have stored is not long enough, so I just return an NA because I just don't know. It doesn't really go goes to the memory there. Okay. So far, so good. So our NA is here. Subset uh, modifications, a vector. We have a vector here that's called fruit, and it has numbers 5, 10, 1, and 20, and I can give my vector names, which is really great. You should always have 
names for your vectors because later on when you look at data, you will have no idea that my first value was always oranges, right? Or was it apples? I, I don't know. But if you give it names, then it actually prints the vector with the names and says, you know, you have five oranges, 10, apple, or 10 bananas, one apple, and 20 peaches. And there's no confusion of, about the order. In C++, often you, you, you make the order mean something, and once you get back to your prog program set, was the first number the number of wins or the number of, of losers, right? And, and it's kind of hard. So it's good to have this here. And then you can also use it in your subsetting. You can say, I want the fruit and I want the apples and the oranges, which is just a, a, a string um, vector. And then it will subset them using the names and says there's one apple and five oranges. So it makes life way easier because it takes this like cognitive overload of, of knowing by heart that I want first and, and second value by just using names for it. Okay, so far so good. We are actually ready to use at least the basics of R and I have some exercises for you that you can do uh, at home. Uh, please do them before next Tuesday and we will go through those uh, next Tuesday. If you have uh, problem solving them, where you can go is the following place. You can go again to, to grand.rproject.org and there is somewhere down here, it says manuals to the left. Let's make this bigger. Oops. No. And the first thing that you will find under manuals is an introduction to R and that has step by step explains the things that we talked about today and has examples, vector assignments, vector arithmetic and so forth and you can, can read it up and go through those examples. So hopefully after doing this exercise, you are able to, to use the, the basic data handling in, in R and we will do more about R um, next time.